It's funny, I don't know where an idea always comes from, but uh, I got this idea, Captain Power, really, was the name was the genesis in a sense. And, uh, and then we, you know, talked about it a little bit, and some of the guys at the office said there was a little kind of phony sound in Captain Powers, you know, like, and plus they thought, well, someone must have done a Captain Power by now. But we checked it out and did a trademark search, and because and, we didn't want to do all this work and find out. And no one ever did Captain Action and Captain America and Captain Bravo, every, every Captain, but no Captain Power. So we said, okay, well, I'm going to get that name, Captain Power. Power on. Captain Power and the soldiers of the future. The genesis for Captain Power was, I was working on a couple of things, and I was working on, I think, Masters of the Universe. And we'd gotten this relationship going with Mattel, and uh, I saw the success they'd had with He-Man and stuff, and I thought, and I'd seen G.I. Joe, but no one had done anything with future soldiers, soldiers of the future. I had the idea that we would uh, maybe call him Captain Power, and they would wear these, these suits, these suits that represented power. And I actually, I thought, well, there must have been a Captain Power. There must, someone must have done a Captain Power. But in fact, no one had. Of course, we wanted to do a story that was more than just for kids, so we always had a dichotomy with this show. But nevertheless, I thought it might appeal to Mattel, and they might finance some shows. Came in one morning to the, to the office, and I, and I went to Tony, my partner at the time, and a few other people. I got this great idea for the next thing we're going to do. It's called Captain Power. If you go back far enough, uh, both uh, Tony Christopher and I Grew up reading Marvel comics and, and uh, you know, Fantastic Four and, and X-Men and Avengers and everything else. And, and Edgar Rice Burroughs' books, you know, Tarzan and John Carter of Mars and The Hobbit and Tolkien and Doc Savage, Conan, you know, everything. So, so in that sense, um, the back history is all the pulp magazines and comic books and pocket books and science fiction and fantasy things that, that, that I grew up reading from the time I was able to read. I think if I was to classify myself... I say I'm a storyteller. Characters begin to speak to you. You sit down and start writing, and the characters, they start telling you who they are. Jonathan Power starts telling you, you just happen to be typing, you know, in my case anyway. And, and that's kind of how it evolved. In fact, the genesis for Captain Power, the, the basic characters and Sauron and Blastar and, and Lord Dread and all these things really evolved in, in one long night of, of typewriter. Two questions. First, it was like, Captain Power is too obvious. And then secondly, can you even get it? I'm like, well, I know we can get it because I did a quick trademark search and it's available. So I think we should just register it anyway. And then in one long night, I knocked out all the basic bios and the basic story, basic setups. And I justified his name by naming him Jonathan Power. So, so I thought that took a little of the edge of it. So he's not really like a superhero. He's not Captain Power. He, he is Jonathan Power. And uh, all of the guys essentially assumed a military rank of some kind. The power suits were created for a reason, to help a human warrior battle against far superior robotic Creatures. I also very early on gave him the credo that they would protect all life. Yes, they fight, they battle, but they only battle against these robotic creatures which became biodreads. We went to Mattel. We made sure we had the trademark registered for Captain Power before we went in because I didn't really want to hear that someone else had already thought of Captain Power. So we got this meeting, we said we think we have the next great thing. And it was not interactive at this point. It was going to be a standalone. The big innovation was simply going to be it's a live action show for kids with CGI robotic villains that our live action guys are going to fight against. When I was a kid I watched Fury and I watched I watched Sky King and there were a lot of live action shows and they had kind of disappeared. So I thought let's do a live action show, it'll stand out. 
let's use CGI, although that was a very new medium, but they immediately lit up Captain Power, and they said, wait, 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 and they went and called everybody, and all suddenly there were like 15 guys in there. Gary came in and made a presentation, Captain Power and Soldiers of the Future. I had worked with Gary on the He-Man movie, and he came in with Captain Power, and it was going to be shot as live action, and uh, I thought it was a great story. Mattel was very interested in it. We had the walls lined with artwork. I took him through the whole thing, and it's so funny, because I finished. One guy says, um, is that name really available? Isn't that, I mean, I, isn't that something I said, you'll be happy to know we've trademarked it, which ended the discussion there, you know. They were so surprised that we'd actually trademarked the name. So very quickly, they got very hot to trot. They didn't tell us why. They asked us to come back three days later. Three days later, they showed us the technology that they had been developing for an interactive show, but they did not have anything to put it with. Action figures were declining. He-Man was declining. We had what we thought was a good idea in the show but we needed really good product, and together we felt they could work. We needed toys that were very unique in order to support and uh, make a property based on the show successful. And they wanted to know, is there a way you can make this work? We had this technology. Obviously, we had a pre-existing relationship with Gary Goddard and thought of him as being an extremely talented and creative guy, and so we tried to marry those two. And this is like the deal with the devil, right? This is like, okay, I can get this show on, but now I've got to make it interactive. So my whole thing was, if we can find a way to do it, I said, look, I don't want to do a show where someone comes on at the beginning and says, kids, go get your interactive jet, and, and, and now it's time to start playing, because I wanted to make a real show. So I said, if there's a way we can do it, we can work it into the story where if someone just turns the show on, an adult or a teenager or whoever, and starts watching it, he will not know there's an interactive element. The only ones that will know are the kids that have it. That'll be their secret thing. And so if there's a way to do the show and we can work the technology in to do that, I'm okay with it. We basically got the technology and we worked out a way creating the, the robot sentries. I mean, if you've seen the show, you know the robot sentries have the targets, some of the bases had targets. We felt we had had some success in the kids' television business and we felt that we could use our expertise and make it a viable business. They had had success with the He-Man shows and uh, they thought, why, well, why don't we get in the TV business? Jeff Sagansky had just become CEO at TriStar Pictures and he wanted to be in television. He flipped over Captain Power and he wanted to do the television series. It would have been TriStar's first television series. They were going to do the whole thing. Because I was saying, well, look, I don't, I don't think Mattel's going to do this unless they do the TV show too. And he said, Gary, they'll do the toys. They're in the toy business. Let the TV guys do the TV show. You should do this. And I arranged a meeting with um, Joe Morrison and John Weems. We had the licensing rights from Gary. We had control of the property. We were putting in the money. Mattel, because of its, its strength in the kids' business, would basically get the show on the air. And why did we need to share everything with... Uh, TriStar. Instead, what that meeting did was, if Mattel had been on the fence at that point about doing the TV show, the fact that TriStar wanted to do the TV show convinced them that, oh my God, this is the show we should do. So for a week and a half, I really was tormented because I really wanted to go with, uh, I mean, now Joe and John, now you're going to hear this, but I, uh, I really wanted to go with TriStar because I knew if we were their first television show, that they would put all of their might behind it and make it work. Clearing a show in the kids' business, the muscle comes from the advertising of the toy company. It doesn't come from the distributor. And I remember I went back to Ziffer and I said, look, they're not going to do it. And he said, they'll do it. Trust me. When we tell them we're doing the show, you think they're going to let the toys go? And I think I was just a little too young and too anxious to get the show done to believe him. But in retrospect, of course he was right. You know. I suddenly say, TriStar is doing the show, and we're doing it, and you don't want to do the toy? Are you crazy? Because then we'll just go over to Hasbro or, or Kenner or whoever it was then. But anyway, we didn't, and um, Mattel gave us full support on the show on the financing side, so I can't complain. We were attempting to take the other side of the equation and control it a little more so that it would be to Mattel's benefit. We were trying to make both the show a success and the syndication effort a profitable uh, business for Mattel. because I don't expect to be coming back. There's much you need to know, my friend. Listen carefully. Gary Goddard is the ultimate pitch man. Clearly the success he's had in the years since Captain Power with theme parks and all the things he's done, that's not a surprise at all. 
uh, he really knows how to prepare his materials, how to pitch something where his heart is really there, you know, on the line. I mean, he has enormous passion. When I saw the drawings on the wall and when I knew what the show was going to be and, and I saw Castle Volcania and the whole notion of what that, the, the potential of what that show could be, I was, I, was, I was already sold. I was eager to work on this show. Gary didn't have to pitch me at all. It was like, I, let me add it. I'm, I'm ready and let's rock and roll. What they had were these big drawings on the wall of, uh, of Captain Power and the other um, soldiers of the future and Lord Dredd, who at the time was called Lord Hacker. I think my favorite illustration of all was uh, Jim Steranko was this brilliant comic book artist who'd done Nick Fury, lots of other titles, and uh, he had this really cool image of Captain Power, which I liked very much. In my initial treatment, there was not a lot of backstory about each of the characters. And I was brought aboard to sketch out that world, inhabit it, make it uh, into a show, change it from a series of drawings into a viable television show. And, and initially I was told that there would be a 65 episode order. So we were going to have a lot of episodes. So it had to be a big vision and a big world. And I was committed to the idea that, that this would be an adult show, that we would create it exactly as if it were an adult show. We wouldn't uh, condescend at all. Taggart and I, we wanted to end war, not fight. All the armies of the world under one voice. Ours. We could have abolished war like that. It wasn't your fault, Stuart. Oh, yes, it was. I knew Taggart was obsessed with power, and with the idea of immortality. Oh, Matt. What have I done? You gambled, Stuart. And if you'd been right, you would have gone down in history as the man who ended war. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing. One way or another, I'm going to end this one. I swear it. I think science fiction has an enormous power and enormous uh, ongoing validity in this world. There's a great tradition of post-apocalyptic stories in science fiction. I mean, we, we were all children. All of us who wrote for Captain Power were children of the Cold War. And the whole notion that in a moment, Earth could be wiped out and you'd be left in the ruins of your planet. That was a landscape that we all lived with. What's the origin of that transmission? Sector 19, used to be San Fran. Mentor. Online, Captain. Can you pinpoint the area that transmission came from? Location, formerly known as the NB District. There's very little left, I'm afraid. West Coast Resistance used it as a base until Dredd eliminated them. We no longer live in the Cold War, the, the shadow of the entire planet being destroyed and left, you know, a devastated ruin. I don't think we're going to see the world destroyed in that way, thank God. But, um, but it's still an extremely beguiling fantasy. Of, of rising from the ruins. As the show was approaching production, uh, by that time I was also writing features. I was being hired to write features. I was working both in television and movies. And I started to realize that, um, that I wouldn't be able, given my deadlines, to, um, to story edit Captain Power and really give it my all. One of my closest friends was J. Michael Straczynski, Joe Straczynski. And he and Michael Reeves and I were sort of the triumvirate of animation writers. And uh, Joe and I had worked together along with Michael on the real Ghostbusters. Joe had story edited it. And Michael and I had written a number of episodes. And, uh, and I saw that Joe was up to the task. Mark Zickrey said uh, he had just worked with Gary Goddard to create this new TV series called Captain Power. And he did not really have any interest in being the showrunner. He didn't want to be there day to day. And they needed someone who could be there as the showrunner. And much to my astonishment and theirs, they hired me. Joe never liked the name. The whole show was sold on that name, Captain Power and the Soldier's Future. So it wasn't like we had any choice. I profoundly hated the title. I would often say to Gary, you know, can we please change it to Power or to Soldiers of the Future? Must it be Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future? Which A, is very long, and B, is the dumbest title in the history of really dumb titles. But they had sold this to um, Mattel, and they figured Captain Power, Soldiers of the Future, is like He-Man, Masters of the Universe. It looks kind of the same, and they were successful with that one, which I also had worked on. So we were stuck with it. And the drawback is that for science fiction fans who were looking for a serious story, they wouldn't tune in to something called Captain Power. And those who would watch a show called Captain Power often weren't in the mood for a serious science fiction story. So we kind of fell between two chairs because of that title. I told them we're going to have to have some heavy action components, but at the bottom line, I want this to be about characters that people care about. I want to be stories that really, you know, have, have, a, have, a, have a moral. Joe got all that. I think he did understand that 
I was having to please two masters, trying to give Mattel enough action that they would be happy, and, and backing him probably more than he knows uh, behind the scenes with Mattel, saying, "No, we got to, you know, we're, we're telling stories. That's what we're doing. We're telling stories that have an action component to them. We're not doing action things that have a little bit of story underneath them. It, it's the opposite. We didn't start this show as an interactive show. That was something that was foisted on us, and I." Even though I'm not sure Joe and everyone realize the time, I'm fighting for them. I, I, I'm the one that contained the interactivity to the robots. I'm the one that contained the interactivity to, you know, to only being in the action sequences. I mean, had I been up to Mattel, we would have had, you know, targets everywhere all the time. I'm a character guy, and I always tend to focus on the character more than the chrome. I knew where all the characters were going, what the larger arc was. Unlike a lot of shows at the time, we wanted Captain Power to have an arc to it. I felt strongly that we need to really make this uh, a story that will be told over time. Even though at the time te series television was, well, you have a half hour episode and that's it, and it ends and you don't change it, you don't have an arc, etc. We didn't care. We were, we were going to have a series arc. We were going to have the show change and change and change and change, and the character relationships change. John, I've wanted to tell you something for such a long time. Scout here. You said I should remind you when it was time to head out. Well, it's time. We're on our way. You were saying? Later. It can wait. After doing sitcoms and stuff like that, when you read something that had a little depth to it, uh, especially when it was a kid's show, but I do remember thinking, this is a kid's show? You know, I thought that a lot. I thought, uh, you know, the, the, I don't think this is a kid's show. You know, I think this is more than a kid's show. And I think as we've seen now, 25 years later, it was more than a kid's show. It was a lot more. This particular show did deal with a lot of heavy subjects. Um, it's a cautionary tale, you know. There are very emotional high points in Captain Power, and we, and we wanted that. Now, toy companies don't want that, but they want to sell toys. Our job is to, is to sell emotions and to sell uh, human interaction. That's what makes a story. No matter what they are to us, they're human beings, and they, and they have feelings like human beings, no matter who the characters are in the show, whether it's a cartoon show, live action show, you want to get into human conflict. If you don't, you have no show. You could do intense stories on it because Mattel was financing it, but they weren't quite running it. We had a whole plan for this that would have gone across several years because I think that at that time, we really hadn't seen a lot of it. And this was where I kind of cut my teeth on Babylon 5 in terms of coming up with a long uh, adult-oriented arc. Never say a machine is more important than a human. You're an innocent. You know that? Innocent? I've been called a lot of things, but... Oh, I know. You've seen a lot. Been through hell. But it's still there. We knew we didn't want to open with the origin. We knew we wanted to come back and do the origin later. We didn't want to open with the traditional origin story. Let's, let's jump right in the middle. Let's meet these characters in action. Let's meet them on a mission. The problem is that you really did, didn't get a sense of where the process began. You didn't know who these characters were, or more importantly, who they had been. Captain Power is ultimately about betrayal, betrayal of humanity. Well, what do you think of the facilities? A little fancier than our old lab, hmm? All the power anyone could ever want is rooted through this room. Dangerous stuff. Yes, but controlled. At least once the final touches are administered. I've made breakthroughs here you can't even imagine. Well, I'm sure it's all very fascinating. What does it have to do with me? I'm offering you the chance to work with me. Stuart, I'm trying to be reasonable. I thought it would be very interesting to look at betrayed friendships, lost parents, surrogate parents, all of that kind of stuff. The whole notion that Lord Dredd and Captain Power's father had been uh, two scientists working together to build the Overmind, and Dredd had basically betrayed uh, Captain Power's father. And I named Captain Power's father after my father. Stuart Gordon Zickrey became Stuart Gordon Power. In the Bible, he was lost, and the notion was we have the Overmind, which is Dredd's computer, you know, genius and mentor. I always liked the idea of, of surrogate families, creating surrogate families as your heroes, and certainly this is what Captain Power was. Basically, people who are there for each other, characters who are there for each other. I can't do it again, not again. You're so no, no, not alone, not alone. I'll be there with you, and I'll find you, and we'll fight it. We'll fight it together. But we've got to hope. We've 
got to hope for what we once were. Captain Power shows up to inspire people, to bring people together, and, and he's building, he's basically building an army and building a force to stand against Lord Dredd's, um, um, you know, battle robots and battle dreads and all of those characters. We would see what humanity been, had been reduced to, which was basically a kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and Captain Power would be someone who could inspire. It's very clear that, that, that people can, can become their worst selves or their best selves depending on who leads them. And so you can either get Hitler or you can get Martin Luther King. I was almost thinking of those two templates for Lord Dredd and Captain Power, basically the best and the worst that humanity had produced. And, uh, and the idea that, that, that Captain Power rises to be someone that can inspire and can lead and, uh, and would ultimately, of course, win out way, way, way down, down the road in the show. The ability of humans to reach out to each other is their great strength. Sacrifice is a word we all know too well. There is no one within the sound of my voice who has not lost someone. A wife, husband, children, friend, lover. But there is one thing we must never lose. Hope. I think it's really important to spend the time to give a proper story and the, the background to our characters. So I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Let me do, you know, a, a two-part episode. Let me give the characters a background. You can release it as a movie if you want to overseas. And they finally agreed and let me write uh, Summoning of Thunder, which the actors really appreciated because they didn't know what the, the background was. And the idea that Lord Dredd would actually let Jonathan Power get away because it's the anniversary of his father's death really broadens out the character. I miss you, Dad. It's never been the same. Hawk sends his best. Bye, Dad. Is leaving. Activate the afterburners and we can be there before. Sauron? Yes, my lord. Return to base. We will proceed alone. Again, the monster never sees the monster in the mirror. And there was a part of Dread that was still compassionate. And that was a conflict between him and Overmind and him and his, his shadow self. I really liked the idea that this is a man who thinks he's doing the right thing. Because he never saw himself as a villain. He thought he was saving mankind. So therefore, if he is indeed that character who is saving mankind, there has to be a measure of compassion, however much that may be distorted. These are dangerous times, Stuart. You have one hour. Beyond that, I cannot be responsible for John's well-being. If it was simply a series in which an omnipotent mad scientist were engaging human beings. I don't think that would be very interesting. Power and his team managed to survive each episode and defeat Dread and his team um, through human values, human values like courage and loyalty and compassion, against which my forces are impotent, thereby defeating me because my technology is worthless against uh, this sort of courage. A new world must prevail. This is your new world. This is what you left humanity. This too will pass. It will be worth it. Nothing is worth this. He's right, my poor friend. You know he's right. You can't change what you were, Dredd. Mattel decided we should shoot it in Toronto because of the savings. At that time, there were massive savings because not only was the dollar just much more powerful than in terms of the exchange, but Toronto had set up uh, some amazing incentives to move up there. And um, in some ways, that was a positive, I think. We, we got this old bus station we converted into basically Captain Power Studio. If we didn't have a building like this, we would certainly have a hard time doing this on the budget that we've got. Uh, we've got so much to do, and you just can't go out and find an outside location of a uh, devastated future city. 
Uh, you've kind of got to have an area where you can create some of these uh, environments. And I mean, this is this is amazing. And it, uh, it's a little frightening that we've got over 150,000 square feet and we're <laughs> filling it up. The location manager that we engaged uh, came up with it. It, uh, it belongs to the city of Toronto. They were uh, kind enough to uh, allow us to uh, lease it, and uh, it's a fantastic uh, area. We we need every inch of the 100,000 feet we have here and, uh, and more. It was tremendously exciting because the scope was gigantic and there was different sections of it. The dread chamber was here, the, the desert was over there. We had a, a miniatures unit that was all, all to themselves, all interconnected within the building. It was a 30 foot by 90 foot uh, green screen set up for all the flying. So you'd be filming uh, you know, a scene and then right across was the miniatures with the computer cameras that would fly through and all that. When I saw that, I never questioned whether these guys knew what they were doing. I found myself having to run around to each of these different uh, sections of the studio, which is so large, that I got a, ended up with a kid's uh, scooter with a uh, very soft inflatable tire so I could just roar to the different parts of the studio. The acoustics were awful and there was, I mean, you could hear straight through it, you could hear everybody working anywhere in the studio. We sprayed a lot of foam uh, all over the ceilings and walls and, and uh, you know, tried, tried to get it reasonably soundproof so we could work, but uh, it didn't, it didn't work. It was, it was such a big project, there were so many things to do. Everyone was working so hard to try and get the thing ready and moving and on its feet. I was, I guess, overwhelmed by the amount of effort and the cost. It seemed like a, an overwhelming project. Yeah, huge. And it was hot. Um, it's hot in Canada in the summertime, in July, in August. It uh, gets to be 90 degrees. And inside, and we were wearing our costumes were these uh, sort of wetsuits kind of thing, three millimeter thick wetsuits with uh, appliques on them to, you know, show all the different uh, uh, wires and what have you. So they, were, they ended up quite thick. And in 90 degrees, when we were working, it was, it was, I thought for sure someone was going to go down. They had buckets of ice, large buckets of ice and cloths in them. And every few minutes, someone would run up to you when you finished a take and squeeze this cold water down your neck and rub the cloth all over you. Otherwise, it was going to be people fainting, and you know, didn't matter. Didn't matter. It was the best job in the world. We had about, if I remember well, five or six suits per character. There was always one, at least one hero suit that was beautiful, you know, shiny, and, and that was made out of fiberglass and, you know, plated with this, you know, special metal, uh, metalizing process. So that took a lot of work, and you couldn't really use those to roll around because they were going to get damaged really easily. There was also a couple of suits that were stunt suits and those were made out of rubber that we figured out how to use to make them flexible. They weren't necessarily that much lighter but they were a little bit more flexible and they weren't going to get damaged um, as easily but the, I don't know that they were very comfortable for the actors. I think they, they went through a lot to you know carry those through the whole show. <laughs> the sets and the costumes and at some time at the beginning, in the beginning, got in our way or got in my way a bit uh, because they lent this uh, feeling of comic book and an unreal sort of situation but once we had learned to just relax into it and relate human to human we found it one heck of a lot easier it was just a real human story and I, and I think that's uh, the thing that we uh, like about most of those kinds of shows the, the really cool ones as you can see, the human element, the, uh, the pain, the suffering, the, the, the sadness, the memory, the, you know, all the things that, that you, 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 you worry about in your own life. It's a... Uh, it's a Christmas tree. It's a Christmas tree. Exactly. It's 4712 Mark 24, John, or had you forgotten? It's been so long. On top of our victory over Project New Order, I thought it was high time. I really loved the show, really loved to do it. And when I heard my character could fly, it was the best thing in the world. When it really came down to flying, it was tough. It was really tough. Come on, kid. Hang on. Oh! The first time I tried on the harness, which was, I believe, an old Superman harness that fit right on your hips and had wires coming from it. And so you were in perfect balance. It was great fun because it would take half of your weight off. 
and you'd feel just, you know, terrific. You know? And they'd lift you up in the air and a slight movement of a hand changed the aspect of your body. It was wonderful, you know, great freedom. But when you were up there for 15 minutes and they had you like this, head down, your head started to swell up. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really uncomfortable. So I, I you know, I, I just couldn't do it. And they hired a stunt guy. And uh, what a brave fellow he was, because he was up there for hours and hours and hours uh, working in front of the green screen, doing all the flying scenes. Um, so yes, it's great to do a character who can fly if you don't have to do the flying. I traveled to Canada a couple of times in the process of this. Once when the show was just gearing up and I met with uh, the cast and saw the sets as they were being constructed because you kind of have to have a sense of how that world looks to be able to write for it. And once again during production. I like to go to the studio and see the studio and I love the studio up here because they had a refrigerator just for beer. <laughs> not, not during shooting hours, but boy the end of the day was was, was great beer drinking times with the crew. The crew worked hard. It was one of the first shows run by computer, uh, which is appropriate for the uh, content of the show, because I would be sitting in LA and I would write a script <coughs> and I would then modem it off, as we said then, modem it off to John Copeland in Canada, who would then get it and we'd fire back notes back and forth to each other. Most shows were still running off of physical hand copies they would carry of scripts they would bring to the set and to the studio. We were firing back and forth on email and downloading things and looking at rough images online, which is, again, we're talking here, um, 86, 87, which long predates uh, uh, the internet as we know it now. We're talking about uh, 56K modems you know, on a K-Pro 2. So the primitive technology was there, but we were using it in an advanced sort of way. We were able to achieve uh, quite a bit of economy uh, when we were shooting. Each director, I, I believe they came in and they did two shows back to back. When the heroes are in the jump jet cockpit, uh, we would try and shoot material for both shows that that director was doing. When we were in the dread chamber, we would try and do the material in there. Each show wasn't done as a distinct piece. We were, we were able to block shoot. So once again, it had to be very well organized. So we, we, everybody knew what was needed in each of the locations. So we were able to have these economies with our time. And I was a big proponent, you know, of, you know, George Lucas's theory of Star Wars. Where it's not a shiny space. It's a, it's a used space. You know, the ships are worn. And I definitely thought, well, that ship's gonna have a lot of wear and tear so I, I you know that, that argument was made to me well you said you want this stuff to look lived in like it's like it's been used and I, I said okay all right let's do it but I just don't want to look in there and feel like I'm looking inside a b-52 bomber you know from World War II and I think the uh, the art directors solved that pretty well I think it looked good I think it worked it was good the argument was we can get this plane for nothing which they did and rather than starting from scratch and building a whole new jump ship let's let's uh, let's take this uh, this this shell, this fuselage, and let's uh, let's make it uh, the interior of the jet, and let's just shoot in there. And I was like, okay, fine. Let's let's make sure it looks cool. Because Toronto was just starting to get going, um, the directors didn't have a lot of experience. I, I think that uh, that the direction was sometimes weak, not really understanding the nature of a sci-fi action show, action adventure sci-fi show. And and uh, and the directors pretty much admitted it. They'd come off straight ahead detective dramas and stuff like that. We were finding our our way for sure. I mean, there's no question about it. The, the, uh, the scope of this hadn't really been uh, done on a regular basis up till now. So we were always pushing to get uh, the action scenes to play better. It wasn't their fault. I think they were just, uh, they were a lot of them, a lot of them were green. A couple of the directors, but we had to hire Canadian directors. It was a point system. We put the value on the script first. So once we had the writers and the Americans and we had a certain number of cast members, Americans, and a certain few other things, then directors had to be Canadian and other things had to be Canadian, so that's just the way it was. We felt Captain Power probably had to be an American actor. And uh, man, we looked and looked and looked. We had casting searches. We saw so many people. We saw a lot of television stars, too, who, who wanted to play it. And, and we were seeing anyone from the age of like 20 to 35, and we were looking for that guy. Tim was the one. He came in and he, he really had the, the charisma, I think, and, and he had the energy. I remember the day I auditioned for the show. Uh, the audition was down on Hollywood Boulevard, right across the street from Grauman's Chinese Theater in a building there. And I remember walking into the audition and they had all of the uh, sketches up on the walls. And I remember thinking, you know, what the, you know, what the heck is this thing? Uh, I was very prepared for the audition, I remember, and I felt, really, I felt like I really did a good job in the audition. And uh, I remember walking out and walking down the street and feeling like that's great. I really I, I got that got that down. I did a good job on that audition. 
And then they called me when I got home and said that something went wrong with the camera that they had filmed the audition with. And they said, can you come back and do it again? Then I got the part, they told me I got the part, and then they told me I had about eight days to move to Canada. I had two cars, an apartment full of furniture, and uh, all that kind of thing. Eight days to, uh, to do it. I've been so involved in, in trying to be involved in the show, in the, in the, the job of acting and, and being here in my schedule and how, what scenes I have to do today and the, the, the job of an actor, that uh, it has, I had forgotten that this is also going to be a, a, a toy and there's like a whole toy line coming out and a lot of exposure and a lot of uh, talk about it. It, it slips your mind at this phase you know, because you're so concentrating on, on so much concentrating on your job. But when I went and I did a commercial for Mattel last week for the toy, and when I walked in and I saw these boxes of you know stacked up with Captain Power, Captain Power, Captain Power, you know it's it's a bit of a, set you back a bit. You know it's a bit frightening for for me. Uh, you know this is sometimes you forget exactly what it is you're doing. It's, it's my job. You know this is I come here, I go to work, I move to Toronto, you know, and I'm still trying to find my way around the city. And yet here, these, I've got to deal with all this in the future. I'm sure it also made me realize that, uh, you know, I have an image for for kids coming up. You know something, you know something I need to think about. Something that uh, takes. Yeah, I feel an obligation uh, towards the kids, I guess, in the character and, and in my life, I, I think. Uh, I think it will change, I think being Captain Power will change me. And I think change me for the better. Ever since then, I look at the scripts and if there's something that I don't feel is right, I will, you know, I'll bring that up. I'll say, I don't know, I don't think he should do it this way. I think it should be, I think he would do it this way. Which is just all a part of, I think, finding the character in a, a process. And the fun part, you know, the rehearsal process and finding it, that's, as an actor, is very, you know, is, is much more fun. I flew to Pittsburgh, I remember, and uh, to a Toys R Us, and put on the Captain Power outfit and, uh, you know, stood there all day. and sign things for kids. I remember, I think Kellogg's came out on the back of a Kellogg's Corn Flakes box. There was a Captain Power face mask or something. And I remember I got a picture, I think, I think I still have it, of me and a little kid wearing that mask. It was one of my favorite things that cracked me up. But um, I also remember that uh, we asked that I could have a, uh, like an RV or something there to change in and to, and uh, they didn't want to do that. They said, well, you can just get dressed in the back. And so finally, I, you know, I'm, I'm usually a pretty agreeable guy, but when it got to that point, I said, listen, either I can have someplace that's going to be hot, it's summer, I, this thing was really a hot suit, I, you know, either you get me a, something, a dressing room where I'm not going. So they finally buckled down and we went down and did it. But yeah, we, you know, I wanted to do whatever I could to promote the show. So. Right after that, Disney, they had a nationwide town search for, for Davy Crockett. And who'd they go with? Tim. I mean, he had that, he had a very great quality as a, as a, as a hero. And, uh, I, fe I feel we let him down a little bit that we didn't have some better directors for him. But other than that, I think he, he came through great. The first action sequences that the local directors did were, uh, um, they were embarrassing. When we first looked at the original dailies that came back from Toronto, yeah, we were all kind of a little leery, shaking in our boots. And the problem was, it just wasn't in what we envisioned as an action show. Um, and we felt that things like the fights and stuff like that, they didn't look like they were staged right. There wasn't, um, you know, the big explosions that we ended up doing eventually and stuff like that. By the time we discovered this, two shows were gonna have to air, we're gonna have to go out by wire like in three weeks. They started production of Captain Power and we were very anxious to see uh, the product that was gonna come out of Canada. Uh, we were all very excited and to see what the show was gonna be. They had actually shot six shows completely. None had been edited, so there was nothing happening with the post-production process. So we had, of course, a delivery date. We had to air the show. So uh, Gary, uh, in his normal fashion, he rallied the troops and said, OK, we've got to get this done. And a few of us went up to Toronto to, uh, to help get that show on the air. If we miss an air date, that's the end of the world. That's a catastrophe from which we can't recover. So I went up, and my job was to take a look at, in particular, the post-production setup, because the complexity, the technical difficulty of this project was enormous. It's a challenge to go take control and responsibility for a group of people who had been formed other, you know, a different way and had their own sort of way that they wanted to advance the work. But uh, I, I managed to uh, influence it in the right way. Uh, when it comes down to it, uh, the people who were working on the project, and especially I think the people in post, were all very talented, very good people with a lot of experience but they had not uh, been uh, 
put together as a unit who fully understood what each individual was going to do to, to advance the project. And that's, I think, where I was helpful. You know, we, we got out of each other's way. You know, the editors edited. The online guys did the online. The uh, effects layers got edited in. You know, so it was, a, it was a lot of moving parts to get organized, and that's really kind of what I did. Um, one thing to bear in mind, too, is that there was no digital storage. So we were working on one-inch videotape. We had all these Sony one-inch machines all locked up together. And to get the layers, we were, at the same time, we had a background, we had a holdover mat, we had a uh, interactive smoke, we had a dread trooper. We could have, you know, sometimes six, seven, eight machines all locked up together. To, to sort of mix it live, if you will, you know? We, we, we couldn't just go back and forth because we'd lose too many generations of quality. So it was a live, full-scale full uh, effects layer mix we did it for every single shot in the show. I think in a period of three weeks, finished two episodes, when prior to that, no episodes had been finished in 12 weeks. Mattel was in a panic. There was really no, no action interactive element except for the, the, the tail thing that we had created at... Uh, at Landmark, we created the, the tail credits, which we knew was going to be, a, you know, a minute's worth of interactivity with the jets over the final credits. So I went back and said, "Okay, I've got an idea. I think I can do this." I looked at the two shows that have been cut together. I looked at the two shows that were in production. I looked at the next shows that were coming out, and the writers were still working on the other shows. But there were basically either six or eight shows in production. I went to them and said, "Okay, we have a new formula now. It's the James Bond formula. We're going to open with an action sequence that triggers all everything else, and the action sequence of the opening will allow the kids to interact." Then you'll flip into your story. Of course, I want these sequences to tie into the story if they can. Joe was a little upset at me because, but I was under, I was in a crucible. I had to do it. I wrote a beginning to each of those shows. Now, what I'm proud of is, I think when you see the shows, they're they're they flow. I don't think anyone sits there and think, oh, someone tagged on that opening. I wrote very quickly. I think in two nights, I looked at every show that was in production, every script, and I came up with a three to five page opening that was action oriented and that would allow us to have the targets, the robots. And what it did was it created a great action energy for the show anyway, it made Mattel happy, and I didn't have to bother the writers. I mean, I mean, again, what Joe doesn't know is, I'm in the meetings taking all the hits on this stuff, you know, I'm not bothering them with it, and trying to come up with some fast solutions. Now, this also meant that we had to shoot these, sh these scenes very rapidly, and we couldn't disturb the, the units. So we had a little rogue unit. A group of us went up to Toronto, and we um, called ourselves the third unit, and we had like four or five series different cameras, including IMO, and every single thing we shot, we shot four or five uh, cameras at one time, all from different placements and different angles and stuff like that. And the great thing about it was we would get up and we'd go out at night and we would just blow st stuff to kingdom come. We had a really, really great time. We were more, you know, uh, on location than we were actually, you know, in the, uh, the bus depot. And we were knocking those scenes out, I think, like, uh I think we maybe had three days for each. It was three days, three days, three days, get these things. But they were high impact, robots, explosions, pyros, all that stuff. And so it was very expensive. Some days you'd go in and, they'd, you know, they'd wire you up for sound. But then they'd also wire you up with squibs all over the place. And it was a lot of fun. I mean, I had a, 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 my helmet on in the middle of this terrible gunfight, this terrible ray blasting fight. And uh, I take a hit right to the helmet, and there's this great explosion on my helmet. And I take it off and look at the helmet and say, you know, as if, you son of a gun, you've dented my helmet. Now you're going to get it. Put it back on and continue firing, you know. It was, it, was, it was like being a child again. It was like playing all the time. As it is, I can say this now. I mean, the fact that I was writing and, and Tony was directing those, sequ those action sequences, that was very much under the radar. But, but there was no other way to get them done that fast. And, and, and with Tony, I could say, no, don't do that, do this. And we need to get something on there that really understands we're looking for energized sequences. And also, you've got to be thinking in your mind, that, that target's got to be on long enough for the kid to target and, and still keep the pacing of the scene going, you know? So, so that was... That was the whole thing that was, was happening at that time. The directors, when we started, didn't know what a plate shot was, okay? The first two episodes are done, and we get a pack of 35 millimeter transparencies. These are the plates. They shot plates of the set. And we had to go up there in a rush and go, okay, it has to be moving footage that we're gonna actually put in the characters and later. It's not, a, it's not a slide of the set. So, I mean, it was that kind of baseline stuff. A lot of trial and error, uh, which, 
on a show that was being as innovative as that, you have to expect. But there was this added layer of the inexperienced directors with sci-fi material that I think also added a layer of complexity. As we're racing to get the show done, we'd had three of the prototype um, jets, and we were adding signals and making sure we were giving we, we were given the encoding from the Mattel engineers of what was required. Each of the special effects sequences had that encoding. With the prototypes in the actual studio, everything was working fine. We were waiting to get the uh, the actual first uh, uh, real shipment, not, not prototypes, but the real toys off the line. And we got those in. They were drop shipped to us. Uh, probably it was within a couple of weeks of having to sh send the first two shows out. But more importantly, they were shipping the toys out. And the sh toys had to be in the marketplace. We get the first box. We all get a jet. We all put the show on. We take our jets. We're sitting about this far, about as far as I am from the camera right now. And we're like, and nothing's happening. Nothing. And we're like, OK, what about you? What about you? No, nothing. Uh -uh. Run, run it again. Run it again. And so now we all just, as all of us, we start edging closer and closer. And I think David Thornton, who was head of post-production, I think finally he walked up to the screen, and, at the, and if you got right to the screen level, it worked. We knew at the time that there wasn't going to be any corrective measures taken by the manufacturer. There are millions of these units already built, boxed, shipped, ready to hit stores. So we knew we'd had to be on the software end. We had to find a way to enlarge those signals enough so that the product would work properly. We found out that the frame had to be a certain size on the TV in order for the interactivity to work. I guess they wanted a pulse which would, uh, at a certain frequency, which would react to the toy. So I developed as part of the, the uniforms of the Dread Troopers uh, a light box, which was on the front and on the back. And there were battery-powered lights in there. There was a little bit of a diffusion to spread the light, and then there was a green gel. So when the lights came on, there was this green image, which could later be dropped out as a green screen image, and the, and the correct pulse would be put in. So, of course, there was only one exposure that this green would work at. And so whether the scenes were day in the desert or uh, dark night uh, interiors, the whole series was shot at one exposure. And that's the exposure that registered the green, which enabled them to use it as a green screen. All of the interactive signals had to be at least four times as big. And as you can imagine, from a production standpoint, that was a nightmare. We had to go out and reshoot all the Dread Troopers with bigger badges on them. And then in post, we came up with some things to layer in. We created this thing called interactive smoke. If you ever look at Captain Power, it looks like the whole place is on fire the entire time. It's because we had to keep layering on these different effects layers to get the interactive signals encoded. We got the encoding in, we got the CGI in, we got the everything, we got the action sequences in, we got it all put together, we've got the music scored, everything. After a serious five or six weeks of work to get the first two shows completely edited, completely mixed and done, um, we uh, met at the post-production studio and David, who was the post-production supervisor and I, uh, watched the uh, FedEx truck pull away from the studio late in the night on its way to ship those shows to New York for the first airing. And uh, we just sat there. It was just a moment of, of, of total relief because we actually had accomplished the task that we set out to do, which at, at the onset seemed almost impossible. Captain Power was an exciting show for me to work on because I was going to be able to score the entire series using a large orchestra. But the tricky part was that I had to score the entire series without seeing one completed episode, let alone a few frames of the finished footage. We had decided early on that we were going to do the music with an original music library. And uh, I was going to write all the music for the library, and we were going to place it to picture. And we figured we would have all the uh, cues written ahead of time, and then we would just place them in the episodes as the episodes were finished. Since there was no footage that I was able to see ahead of time, it was quite difficult coming up with the music. I was able to read several of the scripts, maybe five or six of them, and um, there were a lot of storyboards I was able to look at, and I saw some really nice illustrations. But I wasn't able to get a, a real feeling of the timing and the pacing. I just got a sense of what the show was about. All the cues had to be edited or snipped to fit the picture, so it makes for a less than elegant music edit but we still decided that was the best way to proceed. It's so wild to think about this nowadays because now technology is so affordable. In those days, 1987, they didn't have all the portable digital workstations and software that would allow you to do that. I remember waiting in anticipation up in Toronto uh, after the air date of the first show. I got a call from the writer 
I got a call from the composer and I got a call from the sound effects editor. The writer called and said, I can't hear the dialogue. The composer called and said, I can't hear the music. And the sound effects editor called and said, I can't hear any effects. And I hung up after those three calls, which happened over a few hour period, and I just sat down and I kind of chuckled to myself and I said, you know what? I think we got the perfect mix. I think anytime you work with uh, new technology, there is the question, will this work? Uh, and we were working not just with CGI, but with the whole interactive aspect. There's always massive risk involved, but that's the fun of it. There's no point in doing that which is safe. I'd rather take a chance and fail than do something safe. Because the worst thing that happens if you fail is you fail. They can't kill you, they can't eat you, they can't put you in TV prison. So why not take a chance? Uh, and that was the, the, the fun of it, was walking on the wire. There was the desire to try something that nobody had ever done before. Those experiments are so rare, and it was done really well. The show looked fun, the, the, the scripts were great, the stories were fun, the characters were really, really interesting. And uh, that, I think in, in that sense, that was a huge, huge success and very original. I always knew that we would find a solution. I, I always felt confident, you know. And when I went over and I said, look, you're going to take over every online bay in Toronto and we're going to keep stay in those rooms until we've got episodes finished. What hadn't been anticipated was the complexity and the time it took to actually finish each frame. Obviously there's huge cost impact. Suddenly they go from one online suite to suddenly there are five working around the clock. You know, that's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and quite honestly, we took up so much post-production capacity in Toronto that television advertising moved to Vancouver for that period because they couldn't finish their product in, t in Toronto. We owned those places. So I knew that if you applied enough people long enough, you could finish a show. And uh, that's what we managed to do. CGI was just coming into being at that time. It just wasn't there yet, but it was there enough that people were pushing the medium a little bit. And we were pushing to try and, to try and put this into a live action world. And all things considered, we did a pretty good job. I mean, now, of course, if you look at it, it's, it's I won't say it's primitive, but certainly the mapping and all the other things that you have today, the texture mapping and everything else, would, would make everything look far superior, and the animation as well. Because of the massive amount of uh, horsepower needed on the computers in those days, we were pretty much limited to, I think it was like two or three minutes per episode was all that we could um, come up with. So each of those frames that um, those characters were going to be in, pretty much had to be predetermined. We had to decide how wide the shot was, wh who, which characters were in the, in the frame interacting with them. And when we got to do those sequences, th they'd been laid out months in advance. Some of the preliminary work on the computer animation had been done already, so we really couldn't change uh, those shots. For the humans to interact with the uh, CG characters, we had uh, life-size cardboard cutouts made, and we put them in the scene uh, with the actors, so the actors knew how tall and how far away they were, and they could they could get the correct eye lines, and then we would move them away as we filmed, just before we filmed. One of the big problems was was learning how to work with the CGI, the car CGI characters, and where they were in the scene, especially if it was multiple actors all trying to follow this character who's this evil thing flying across the sky. And there was little interactive elements put into the scene. There'd be little puffs in the dirt when the character would land, so it would tie the uh, CG characters in with the, um, with the live action, which integrated them very well. Also, because the CG characters were very metallic, we had two basically glorified beach balls. One was sprayed with silver paint, uh, to represent the Sauron character, and one was sprayed with a copper paint to represent Blastar. So by just before we did uh, the sequence of the shot, we would put that ball in where the character would be, and then that ball would reflect the light. Where was the light coming from? How strong was it? What color was it? What sort of contrast was there on the light between the light and the dark? So the effects team, the ARCA team, could analyze those, those silvery balls, those reflective balls, and give the same lighting to the uh, CG characters. So we, we often work very, very closely together. Not having a reference, not knowing really at that time what CGI was and, and, and what it was going to look like, when we were trying to act with all these imaginary characters, these, these, these beasts flying around and, and feeling, you know, quite silly, you know, pointing our guns at nothing and and pretending to duck and, 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 and not knowing what was going to happen. And it was really difficult. And it, you had to just sort of 
trust and believe that some of these, this huge gang of people knew what the hell they were doing. And, and so you, you did, you just threw yourself into it and, and hoped it was going to work. And when we saw the results, the final results, well, you know, it, it felt pretty good because, you know, it actually, it actually did work. The same thing for me with the model work. I thought, this is going to look like a model, but it doesn't. It was, it was just terrific. It was really, really great. I would write a script, or the writers would turn in a script, and I, I and they would essentially go for whatever made sense for the story. Once it came in, John Copeland would go over it um, and determine whether or not this could actually work. If it couldn't, we would revise accordingly. We weren't told a lot of times that something wouldn't work. Most times we were told, yeah, we can make this happen. There were limitations to the degree which uh, we could have our human characters directly interact with them. Uh, having them throw a punch would be difficult in the same frame. But a lot of what we had in mind we could do. And bear in mind, too, that you're talking about characters who were at some distance from each other firing at each other. So you could you know, not worry about too much about the comping of the CGI. A lot of today's innovators in that medium came out of that group. That was like a, a melting pot of, of people that were allowed, thanks to Mattel really, to, to push the art. And, and man, we were pushing. <laughs> we were pushing very hard. Rob Coleman, of course, went on to be head of CG uh, you know, at, at, I, at ILM. So I mean, this was, you know, th this was just an amazing, amazing A-team of creative personnel on Captain Power. I'm Rob Coleman. I'm one of the assistant animators. And I'm just uh, checking the timing in the first episode and just seeing what we're responsible for animating. We're responsible for a scene here where Soren comes in and digitizes one of the live action characters um, with his digitized, digitizing beam. Soren goes around and digitizes different people and with the goal to create this supercomputer with all kinds of um, humans inside it. So that's what we're responsible for. We weren't sure what could be done, what could be pulled off, how it would all integrate. In fact, when I would say, what can we do and what can't we do, they could never give me that answer. And so it was extremely difficult to write episodes that were within production parameters when, when no one knew what those parameters were. We knew that there were going to be interactive toys, and we would say, as writers, we were saying, well, will you be seeing the signal that emanates from the television to, to the toys? And initially, we were being told, no, it, it would be an invisible infrared signal. And then when we saw the show and there was this flashing, you know, a chroma key thing, we were going, oh no. There were a number of um, citizens groups and pressure groups that came after us on both violence and the interactivity aspect of it. We became the whipping boy for any group out there that wanted to get publicity for itself by attacking a TV show. We were doing something completely cutting edge that had never been done before, but we were basically fighting, you know, the whole against, you know, interactivity on TV sequence. So it had to be right. I mean, we expected something, but I don't think we expected it to the level that it became. We were getting tremendous, you know, press related to that. I attempted to call Peggy Chern at one time because I read some quote that was just outrageous. She always set herself up as, as the expert, as the judge and jury, and uh, in actuality, she was pretty stupid a lot of times. A lot of things she said were pretty lame. She created a lot of headaches for the executives of the toy companies and television stations at the time. She liked the power of her own voice. She liked to hear herself speak. And uh, I think she started to buy into her own PR after a while, like she was actually the savior of kids and stuff. In fact, what she wrought on the industry today, because of her, now we have a really bad situation where, where shows are commercials, commercials are shows. It's just, she's one of the causes of it. So rather than help the situation, and I will grant you that when she started, she may have had some positive motives, but she would not listen. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good with everybody, you know, but how about you listen and consider things on its own merits? But when we tried to reason with him and say, let us tell you about this show, his entire purpose of being is to preserve all life. They were like, oh, that, you know, oh, that. No, really, that's, that's the story. The whole thing was terribly frustrating because the show was an affirmation of life. It's an affirmation of hope. It says that, you know, we can persevere against the machines, that there is something inherently noble about being human. And they ignored that in deference to the fact that there are guns. You have a jet. You don't have a gun. You only fire right. And they don't want to hear it. And to attack a TV show for violence is like, ta it's like putting on a suit of armor to attack a hot fudge Sunday. Uh, it's overcompensating and it doesn't deal with the problem. It deals with a picture of the problem, not the problem itself. So rather than taking an attitude, well, let me listen at least. Let me see if maybe these people really are trying to do something that's positive. No. Every toy company is a villain. 
every toy company is only interested in, in, in selling kids on, on violent games. They're about to attack. And of course, Peggy Sharon can always point to the one kid who watches Superman and thinks he can fly and jumps off a roof. But you know what? Most kids don't do that. A kid that does that already has something wrong. Uh, and most kids do not go out after having played with a toy gun and buy a real gun and try and shoot people. You know, uh, believe it or not, kids understand the difference between fantasy and reality. But Peggy had a different agenda. Her agenda was all about making Peggy Peggy more famous and making her, you know, you, I mean, you can tell now, now that she's, she's an echo of, of that time. But um, what I was upset with was she would not listen. I don't think Captain Power warped or, or destroyed children. I think that it presented people pulling together to help each other. I think it said that there was something to be valued in compassion. I was a Captain Power uh, kid. I played Captain Power every week. I shot at the screen at least a million times. And to this day, I have never been arrested. I have never shot anyone in real life. And I don't even own a gun. I never had a moment of guilt or second thought about what we were doing. It was, I think, very telling that uh, one of the people who um, was most critical of the show as a consultant uh, and just uh, constantly attacking the show in the press uh, said, I will stop attacking the show if you hire me on as a consultant. So we hired this person on as a consultant and suddenly the show was much better but not a single word of the script ever got changed. Uh, so you have to wonder what was the actual objective. The excitement has already begun in living rooms just like yours. Come on, Dad, it's time. We actually first launched it in in, in pre-toy fair in in Arizona uh, in January of that year. I went to toy fair and saw the presentation and everything, and everyone thought it was going to be a big smash toy line. And of course, the interactivity heightened that whole idea. Mattel stock at the time was wallowing at about six dollars or so. Within about a month and a half, it was up to about ten. I mean, there was just a terrific response to the overall innovation of Captain Power. There was a lot of excitement about it. I mean, it was, it was just very new. It was very different. The initial sales and everything were very good. Uh, you know, I think there was a lot of excitement in the, in the toy trade. I'm sure we started to ship it in sometime in the late summer, and then the show went on the air in the fall. So, no, I think everything was coordinated pretty well. When you love a show, you want to be part of that world as much as possible, and Captain Power really allowed for interactivity in a way that hadn't been seen before. And I remember um, when we were writing the show, we'd, we'd haunt Toys R Us. We'd, we'd go and buy these figures. We weren't, we weren't proud. We were all given one of these when it first came out. And I thought, I thought, what a great gift for my son. What a terrific thing to bring home a wee statue of his daddy working on this show. But when I got it home, I said to him, Let's not open it. Let's leave it in the package. <laughs> so I didn't, I, I, I wanted to keep it forever like this. I, I didn't want it to end up in the bottom of his toy box like this. I was, I was quite, you know, quite chuffed with the whole idea of being, yes, immortalized in plastic. That's me. Actually, I bought these, uh, uh, the uh, Asian version from Singapore. There was uh, one guy uh, at American Airlines, I can tell you that, that's all I remember. He said, he recognized me. He said, aren't you? I said, yeah, and I said, uh, I was on a flight, and you know, I'm 6'5", so he, I was in a middle seat trying to get wherever I was going. And I said, uh, any chance I could uh, get upgraded? And he said, well, I don't know, maybe. So I pulled one of these out right here, and he said, oh, we just happened to have a seat open. <laughs> so yeah, I got to, uh, you know. And then he made me say power on. Clearly you can see what a, an accurate rendering this is. Um, but it is still, still, uh, and that her, <laughs> that her hands are like this. <laughs> yeah, they're permanently like this. So she'll always get work, I'm sure. <laughs> You're going to save the world by destroying it. Seems to me I've heard that before, and always by someone who thinks that he knows what's best for all of us. If you just listen, how many more will die, Taggart? How many more innocent human lives are going to be wasted for your dream of a machine age? Thousands? Millions? Tens of millions? And where does it stop? The problem with science fiction has always been that the networks don't understand it. 
uh, particularly back then, we're talking in the 80s, uh, this is a time when the networks were terrified of science fiction. And since syndication provided an opportunity for us to get a toehold and expand the syndication marketplace, which oddly enough was created by He-Man. Before He-Man, there really wasn't a syndication marketplace for new programming. For old programming, sure, reruns, absolutely. But that was on the first shows to create new programming for syndication. Captain Power came along, further expanded that and brought live action more into it and made it more of a mainstream within the genre form. Uh, those shows that came afterward, from B5 to the Star Trek shows that took advantage of syndication, really kind of capitalized or built upon the foundation that we built with this show. It was a mad scramble to, to launch the show. Mattel had, uh, through MTS, had made arrangements with all the different broadcasters. You go to the stations, they put the show on the air. The way the stations pay for it is in terms of advertising. That's the barter part of it. You, you get the advertising, you get two minutes, two commercials, whatever. I mean, it, it all depends on the deal. And then that has to be sold. So if TriStar did it, they would get two minutes, then they would go out and sell it in the kid's marketplace. Well, Mattel has a use for that advertising, so that's what they took. That's what we took. And we also then didn't have to pay a distribution fee, which in, in, the, in, the, in the business is pretty significant. We had 96 uh, domestic stations, and then I think we had uh, 20 foreign territories. And that grew very rapidly. Uh, Cabin Power was very successful. I think we grew to 200 uh, actual stations in the U.S. and over 60 uh, around the world. It got introduced to it through the commercial. And the commercial was so interesting. My new cake mix. You have the power on. All right. And it's so delicious. I think we're getting through, Captain. What year? 1987, I think. Try it. Hello to anybody watching. This is Captain Power. Jonathan Power, do you read? We have a situation here. The year is 2147. Human life is threatened by bio dreads. They follow a Lord Dread. I need your help. And that actually uh, really, really piqued my curiosity and made me tune in to, uh, to the show. The call from the future commercial was my idea. I, I said to Mattel, because uh, we were seeing some stuff some agency had did. I was just looking at the same old stuff. I was like, guys, I, we need to do something better than that, I think, you know? I have instructions. Please pay attention. Weekly program transmissions on TV begin September. If you have the power jet XT7, the XT7, you can fire invisible beams at enemy targets on these transmissions. Score or be hit. Warning, the TV show will fire back. It will fire back. That commercial uh, was actually, uh, in terms of the advertising community, everyone loved it except there was a small group of stations I guess who because the show wasn't on their station and they were saying you're tricking us because it's not really a toy commercial it's a commercial for the show and that show's not on our station so we don't want to run it but very few even to this day as a commercial if you watch it 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 holds up pretty good it's it's uh, and I think the commercial just like the show it didn't treat kids like they're idiots you know we, we were we were we were we were saying look these kids there, they're smarter than you think they are, and they'll pick up on this stuff, and they'll like it, and they'll embrace it. And I, I think they did. Watching it made me feel, and I was just a little boy, but it made me feel like a TV show was taking me seriously. This is the new voice of the resistance, Freedom 2. And if anything happens to me, there's going to be a Freedom 3, and 4, and 5. We didn't start this war, but we're going to finish it. There was no network, there was no studio as such. I mean, we weren't getting notes from Paramount or Warners or Universal or NBC or CBS, etc. So we were left with an extremely free hand to develop a very adult show, a very interesting show, an extremely varied show. I made something like this myself once. I was just a kid. Scrounged up the parts, cobbled it together. Even found a couple of batteries for the lights. When my mother saw it, <laughs> God, I thought she'd never stop crying. I said I was sorry. Figured maybe I hadn't done it right. She laughed, smiled, kept right on crying. What we'd lost. And what we still had.
This was basically, you know, the writers and, and the producers sitting around saying, hey, what, what story do we want to tell? There was a character introduced in the um, original draftsmanship and the original premise for, for um, Captain Power, uh, Stingray Johnson. He was going to be in the water, but he got cut early on because everyone was like, we can't do a show with a guy in the water, we can't have water scenes. The problem was we couldn't afford to shoot underwater. It required a really big tank. We're going to keep him in right to the last minute. The toy actually got made. I mean, so it was, it was very late in the day. We just said, OK, we're not going to do water. We'll bring him in later. One of the characters that we had, which we didn't get to do, unfortunately, was a character named Silvera. And she was a, a female robot, very, very strongly influenced by the robot in Metropolis. At that time, there was a Japanese artist that was doing these beautiful silver women you know, that looked completely reflective and metal, very beautiful. I was thinking that we might be able to create a, a female robot like that that Dredd had created for his own nefarious reasons. I was thinking we'd just get an actress and they would be able to like, you know, basically go right over her and do it. At the end of season one, she was going to be sent, sent by Lord Dredd, disguised as a human, to infil infiltrate uh, the power base. And she was going to fall in love with Captain Power and become a double agent and go back, basically, ostensibly work working for Lord Dredd, but really working for Captain Power to bring about his overthrow. And that, for me, that was one of the most interesting characters of all. Falcor was going to be this CGI falcon, basically, a robotic falcon that he would have on his hand and he would release to go spy for him. And, and one of the ideas was that whatever Falcor could see, he could see it automatically. CGI just was not to the point. The idea of having this CGI falcon that would land on his hand, and it was just like the guys were like, no way we can do that. These characters that got cut were cut more for technical reasons than for story reasons initially. When we did the show, it was still at the very um, early days of syndication, and therefore it was on all over the map. It was on some stations in the morning, some in the afternoon, or even the evening. Uh, they would flip it around depending on what their needs were. It was a very complicated, hard show to find, let alone watch. You needed uh, a, a calendar, a Ouija board, and a hunting dog to find the show on any particular day. MTS was a new company. They had no clout to get these shows on the air in the right time slots. And, and what I think what would have happened with uh, TriStar, it's all conjecture, of course, but TriStar would have thrown the entire weight of the studio behind this to make sure that this show was premiered in, in, in a major way, and they would have fought for the right time slots. I think if you look back, you'll see where we were in the adult zone, where we were in 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night. There were, there were markets, I think it was Boston or Philadelphia, I can't remember. There were markets where we were right up against the new Star Trek Next Generation, and uh, we beat them. We were beating them in their own time slots. The fact that the fans did tune in and made it a point to try and find the show uh, says that we were doing something right with the story. It's no coincidence that Star Trek in their second season added more action. The first season, if you look back at the reviews of, the, of that Star Trek, you'll see it was very cerebral. It was all talk, very little action. They didn't have the Borg until a year later. There is no question in my mind that consciously or subconsciously, Lord Dredd and the uh, Bio-Dreads and the whole idea of absorbing them into uh, the New Order you know, this was at the root of the whole idea of the Borg. What I couldn't believe was how much they made the Borg look like Lord Dredd. And it's a constant series of frustration for me to, you know, because all these people go, oh, did you copy the Borg? I'm like, no, they copied us. <laughs> people look at Lord Dredd now and they say, well, he's a Borg. But the funny thing is, of course, uh, we came first. <laughs> Emotions are the enemy of order. You are now one of us. Immortal. Perfect. Yes. Yes, I understand. The past is gone. From this day on, Lyman Taggart is dead, and Lord Dread lives. Resistance is futile. It was on one of the comic books. I do remember that. I think we were all elated, and and when we saw the reviews and we saw the ratings, it was you know for us it was through the roof. It was it was a, it was a sure fire hit. In the stories, we often dealt with themes of guilt, uh, episodes where. Uh, pilots passed as a member of the Dread Youth caught up with her. I remember when we found you. Got you away from the Dread Youth. You were so full of rage. We were worried whether you would make it or not. I'm glad you did.
We never ducked the issue that she actually was a member of Dread Youth, and she did terrible things, as we all from time to time do terrible things in our own lives, uh, whether intentionally or otherwise, we all make mistakes. And the point of the show was, it's not what, that you made a mistake before, it's a question of what can you do now to make up for that and atone or do the right thing in the present tense. These are rather adult concepts. And there were, from time to time, little grumblings from Mattel about why are we doing this. But I think a lot of it kind of shot over their heads. And consequently, they left us alone. Jessica made it very clear that she wanted to move on from the show. She felt it was limiting her as an actress, which I can understand. We liked her so much, but she would not sign on for more than the first year. And she decided she wouldn't do the second year. And this is before we knew we were going to do the second year. So we said, well, if she's not coming back, let's take her out in a dramatic way. One more thing. When we get back to the base, I'd very much like to finish our conversation. I think we have a lot to talk about. All right. I was wary of the n negative futuristic look, the post-apocalyptic look, and, you know, that humans had been whittled down to this tiny core uh, and were surrounded by evil all the time. So, yes, it was heavy. I thought, I, I felt like I couldn't live there for six years. So we didn't know when we started the shows that we were going to write her out. But once we realized we were going to have to, we decided, let's, let's make it powerful. Jennifer, hold on. Hold on, we're going to come. No. Stay clear. The auto destruct is no good. I have to blow. The, I have to blow the power power source. It's the only way. We're on our way to get you right now. We're on our, there's another way to do it. It's too late. We're all broken up inside. Stay clear. I'm sorry we never got to finish our talk. Jennifer, don't. I love you, John, so much. <laughs> You think of me sometimes. And so we decided to uh, remove her in what was actually a very moving sequence. When she you know, hits the, uh, the buttons and says, go to hell, uh, knowing she's going to die in the process, but also take out you know, the power central and uh, the biodread, it's a very powerful moment. Back then, in any show, let alone a kid's show, the idea of killing one of your lead characters is, was, you know, you just wouldn't do it. And, uh, and man, that, that had such a reaction. Fans were writing in, oh, I know what happened. You know, at the last minute, the Overmind got her, and she's there, and she's going to come back, and all these theories about what happened right before that explosion. I think to try and bring her back from that after the fact would cheapen it. Even if the actress, you know, didn't want to come back or did want to come back, I would leave the character dead because to undo that would diminish the sacrifice. There are stakes, and sometimes the good guys don't survive, and sometimes they have to sacrifice themselves, and it gives a, a depth to the story and, a, and an emotional resonance and a weight, and it also informs real life, because in real life people die, and in real life sometimes the good guys lose, and sometimes there's um, self-sacrifice. Power suits. Back up for mentor systems. She must have got it all up before. Her... How could it happen, Captain? How? Captain Power, everybody wanted it. Everybody in the trade wanted it. Uh, the show was doing the show was doing fine, and there was a great demand on the part of the trade. I think Captain Power got hurt because of something that didn't have to do with either the toy or the television show. It was, it was the cor uh, corporate needs from Mattel uh, on sales and the trade's desire to just get more and more new stuff. And I think that's, that's what hurt it. I think if there had been a little more moderation on both the, the toy trade and Mattel, uh, it would have lasted much longer. Mattel, the corporation, was having, I mean, was having some tough years. There were some difficulties with other brands. Mattel made a decision to ship a lot of product into the marketplace. And there was, a lot of it was shipped late in the year, and it wound up not selling through at Christmas. I think if we had backed off and shipped it to a level that we thought was sustainable, it would have gone on. If the show had been produced and marketed by a, a studio or a network, who was vested in the show, 
they wouldn't have cared. Look, the toy is fine. Whatever they sold the toy is fine. We're, the show's a hit. We're doing the show. I think Joe and John got blocked when, 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 the, when the toys didn't sell the way they did. They were like, well, we're not putting any more money in this MTS thing. And that's too bad because I think actually it could have done quite well. I mean, look now, Hasbro's in the TV business. I mean, uh, it, it's interesting where everything's gone anyway. We were all tremendously proud of the show. It was uh, a shame we couldn't really go right away into season number two. We'd all learned a lot. We'd established a lot of the things. The, the very expensive outfits were made. There was, you know, a number of elements that were in place. And with what we had learned, it had just been a, a really a breeze to go into season two. So we were all very disappointed that it didn't continue. While we were doing the show, we were so happy and so proud of it that I actually thought the thing was going to go on for... You know, I thought we'd make do it for five or six or eight years. I thought we'd be doing it for a long time. The, the truth is, at that point, we, we thought we had a five or six year thing going. You know what I mean? I mean, we were, we were sure of it. We thought we were on top of the world. And so then when they started to talk about pulling the plug on that, we, we just, you know, we couldn't figure it out. It was a difficult window because it took us a little while, you know, well, who owns the toys and who owns this and who gets that? And I was saying, look, you got to give me these shows back. If you're out of the TV business, I want those shows. And, uh, and I got the shows, but it took a long time to do it. And so it was, it was, it was messy. It wasn't negative. There was never a fight. There was never any legal aspects. I, Mattel actually was very, very fair. Joe, John were fair. Everyone was fair. Uh, it just took time. It wasn't something that happens. We would have needed them to say, okay, we want you to quit claim now, right now, because we're going to run down the street and try and get someone to do this. You know? As I finished up working on Captain Power, I looked at the production model that we had developed, which was really unique unto itself, because most TV shows, live action, were very expensive. They shot outdoors. Um, they didn't have a lot of effects because it couldn't be done. The, the V series almost single-handedly bankrupted Warner Brothers. And I thought we could take this production model, a concept like Babylon 5, and use Captain Power in a way as proof of concept. And you can take a show, shoot it in a warehouse, use you know, CGI for characters, for uh, ships, for establishing a world or set extensions, and make it work and do it you know, for, for a price. Using the Captain Power model, we were able to do Babylon 5 for half of what it would cost uh, for a network show using previous technology. And other shows built upon our model. Clearly, Captain Power set in motion a production model that has been used ever since then by both B5 and other shows. We never stopped trying on Captain Power. We always said, how can we make the stories better? How can we make the stories more intense so we can do more with the characters? Um, I think that that intelligence and that desire to keep improving the show and never settling for what it could be, but always focus on what it might be, is what made the show endure what a lot of shows did not. It really starts from the top down and believing in telling a decent story. When the show first came out, we were all very excited. I started getting my first fan mail, and I got it from America and I got it from Japan, and I got it from Europe. And I, was, I was absolutely shocked. I got lovely letters, you know, endearing letters, letters that, you know, that people said it was their favorite show, and you think, God, you know, the work we've done is, is, is having an effect on people, and that makes you feel good. But if you just put the work out there, and the feedback comes in from here and there and all over the place from ordinary people saying that they've been touched by the show, and, and they love it, and it's what they'd like to do when they grow up, is, is you know, work in animation or work in film and work in, in, in you know, science fiction or whatever. It's, it's, it's really very pleasing, it's very satisfying. I get emails every day, uh, every day uh, from fans, and, and not just fans from here, from Russia, Sweden, China, everywhere. Now, the show touched, obviously, I mean, if you're, I'm still hearing from these people, it, it touched them not just as a show, it touched part of their lives or how they look at life and then the future. At one point there was a lot of mail coming and as I said, I, I, I had trouble even writing back my wedding thank yous. Um, but so I got behind, really behind, and this girl had written um, a diary. She sent me her diary basically. And she had written so much detail about her first sip of beer, her first kiss, she named her horse after my character. Um, I was just like blown away that she not only t spoke 
wrote to me every day, but she then sent it to me. I got it. And so we tracked her down. We um, looked her up uh, and found her and got her on the phone. And I, I said, I, this is the weirdest thing, but I have your diary from when you were a teenager. Do you want it back? <laughs> Do you want to read it? Do you want to see it? Because it's really touching and sweet. Anyway, that, um, she was, we had a good conversation. It was really fun. And uh, she didn't want it back. <laughs> she, she was said, no, did it, wrote it, I moved on. I'm like, well, I guess then I will too. I hope you're not offended. I, I'll move on also. But yeah, that was sweet. When you write for television, you're writing into the ether. Uh, you come up with a story which is broadcast out. You never see the audience reaction as you did in the live theater. And you hope that it will find a home somewhere. And you hope that, you know, years down the road, someone will say, you did a good story. And so it's rewarding and demonstrative of the fact that we did a good job, that today, here we are, you know, 20 plus years later, and I still get comments from people about Cabin Power, I still get fan mail from people, and it's a nice reaffirmation that what we said about human nature, human dignity, persists. It's a terrific thing that I still hear from the fans, and, then, and they definitely are still out there looking for more information. They always say, you know, they are going to bring it back. It's not mine to bring back, it's Gary's to bring back if he chooses to do so. They are still talking about uh, bringing the show back in one way or another. And I think that, again, is testimony to the fact that we told some good stories. To sit here so many years later to get a call out of the blue saying, you know, we want to revisit some of this material, it was, it's a real treat to find that there's some interest uh, out there, uh, considering how long the show had gone. We were doing the first live action show with CGI robotic villains that had to actually be composited, and we had to have the interactive aspect working. And we had to turn it out on an unbelievable schedule because, as always with these things, you know, once Mattel said go, then, you know, they wanted it like now. So uh, it, was, it was very challenging. When you become immersed in a project like we were immersed in Captain Power, Sometimes it's easy to sort of lose perspective because you're working so hard. You live and breathe this project day in and day out, and uh, you put everything you've got into it. And I'm talking about everybody, the writers, the producers, directors, the actors, the, the production team, and all of us that were looking after the post-production side. You get so immersed in it, you start to wonder, gosh, is this thing really any good? You really don't know. And when we finally delivered the first show and the second show and it started to air we began to get the feedback from our colleagues in the business our peers the public um, certainly Mattel and and the executives that were responsible for Captain Power and the reactions were so overwhelming it, it was it was gratifying to realize that something that we had really invested so much of ourselves in turned out to be just a wonderful product I think it stands out for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first of all, technologically, it was quite an achievement. And I'm not sure that the average viewer at the time would have quite understood that. I think other people in the industry looking at it probably went, wow, that's, that's a pretty ambitious show. There's never been anything before it or after it that looked anything like it. And so for good or ill, you know, it was unique. It was very unique in that way. And the way we shot it and produced it, of it being more like a drama or a very serious science fiction movie of the time. You know, we shot a million feet of film. You know, we had incredible resources at Bear to make this TV show work. You know, more, th more like you would expect for a primetime show or something like that. It was really a different idea. It was a uh, really, you know, challenging uh, concept to say, I'm going to have CGI characters in every episode of a syndicated TV show. That was a very nervy move right from the start. And, and I think that it, you know, probably... Uh, helped people imagine a future where digital characters were more likely to happen. I think it was pretty groundbreaking. I think it set the stage for a lot of shows that came after us. Um, you know, the things that we were doing, which uh, had painstaking uh, computer power, can easily be done on your uh, kitchen table with a laptop now. Uh, so, uh, but it was, it was fun to do it at the time we did it, and uh, it's great to see that there's still some interest in it. I'm really proud of the show. I'm proud of the work that all of us did on the show, from the actors to the uh, CG people to the uh, producers, the creators, the writers. Um, you know, that was a great group. And what was really fun and my most fond memory is there was nothing else like it. There was no, I'd never heard anything like it. I'd never seen anything like it. And uh, I was just 
you know, really proud to be the, uh, you know, the character that the name of the show was. That was the first time I'd ever had a, uh, a part, you know, where I was, uh, wasn't just the guy who came as a guest star or something like that. We spent a lot of time together, more time than you would spend with anybody. You're not, you know, you're married to each other, but even married people don't spend that much time sitting, uh, you know, in trying circumstances. Um, and so the, the most outstanding thing about being with those guys was how much we laughed and how, you know, when you're playing make-believe, it's easy to pop out of the bubble or pop out of the reality of what you're doing. And, you know, here we are sitting in these suits and we're pointing these little, you know, it, so it gets, it, there's, on the one hand, we have to be very grave and in the moment and be taken seriously. On the other hand, we just laugh and get hysterical and um, get through it together. And it was, that was... I, they were family. At the time when we were doing it, uh, I don't think any of us were looking, you know, this far in the future to imagine what kind of an effect, you know, that work would have and, and what, you know, how, uh, how it would, uh, you know, its staying power, how would it still be around, would still people, would people still know about it, you know, 10, 15, 20 years later. You know, we put everything we had into those shows. I mean, they were really they really meant so much to us at the time. Gary said, we're gonna, just going to make a Clash show here. I don't want to, if I'm going to crash and burn, I'll crash and burn with, a, with a, clash, a, a Clash show. And we felt the same way. Let's just do the best writing we can. We decided very early on, and again, this, this comes from the, the Gary school of thinking, if you will, that we were going to do stories that not only made sense, okay, but that were involving. And when Gene Siskel made the comment, you know, and gave us an incredible review. I mean, this was a major film critic looking at a children's TV show and saying, hey, this is serious stuff here. You know, the writing's incredible. Some of the ideas that were being created within the stories were so, you know, ahead of their time, particularly for television. And I think that all these years later, a lot of it really holds up. For those people that grew up on uh, Captain Power, it worked. It absolutely worked just the way we wanted it to work. It was a great science fiction fantasy adventure. It used the latest technologies. It told a story in a language that they understood. I think we set out to create a universe and a compelling story. If the story hadn't worked, no one remembered at all. It's to be determined by others in what place it's gonna, it's gonna have. But I think it was certainly something that has inspired uh, a generation of other writers, directors, and producers, and executives, because I find myself running into them now, and they're like, you created Captain Power? Oh my God, I love that show. So, that's great. It was uh, probably, uh, you know, one of the best times of my life. Uh, uh, I look back on it with, with all the, the, the trouble that the show had and the, the hardship of filming that show. It's funny, after all these years, I don't really have any bad memories. Uh, my, my main thing that I value was the work we did and the people I worked with and uh, the friendships that I made. And, uh, you know, those are the things that stick with you forever. As long as this show goes, we will try and make it grow and grow. We know where the first 26 episodes are going to end. We also know where, the, if we go on to do 65, where the 65th one will end. And that will be a big shock, that one, if, if, if we do all those. And we know where we'll pick up and where the next group will go. So we've, we've set benchmarks for ourselves. And we didn't want to be like a regular TV series. We wanted to really throw the audience for a loop. So you may see, you may see some of the characters, some of the heroes die. You may see um, you know, um, some of the major elements change. I mean, it, 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 the, it will continue to grow, and things will happen, um, unlike most you know, typical series. This was an idea that was definitely ahead of its time and the technology was playing catch up to make it happen. We can create this world now. We can really bring to this what I had hoped to bring to it the first time around. It's a complete universe which really should be reimagined and brought to life with today's technologies. Now, really, anything we can envision, we can create. And it would be great to, uh, it would be great to, to revisit that.